Little House in the Prairie. That was an exciting chapter last time. I was actually looking up some, um, looking at some historical information about this time period and finding out what was going on. And um, at that time, the United States government was trying to make deals with the um, Native Americans so that they would move into reservations. And, and um, one of the things that the Native Americans thought of was that when the people were coming and settling on the, what they consider to be their territory, scenes like this would happen because the Native Americans felt that going into the white man's home and just asking for things and taking things was really like their rent that the white people owed them for coming and staying there. Um, so, you know, it's a hard time in history for the Native Americans, for sure, when you start looking at all this in the timeline. Um, and eventually they pretty much got moved into um, reservations and off that land. But Pa was um, definitely wanting to respect the Native Americans and, and keep peace with them. Okay, so the next chapter is called Fresh Water to Drink. Pa had made the bed frame. He had smoothed the oak slabs till there was not a splinter on them. Then he pegged them firmly together. Four slabs made a box to hold the straw tick. Across the bottom of it, Pa stretched a rope, zigzag from side to side and pulled it tight. On the end of the bedstead, Pa pegged solidly to the wall in a corner of the house. Oh, sorry, one end of the bedstead. Only one corner of the bed was not against the wall. At this corner, Pa set up a tall slab and he pegged it to the bedstead. As high as he could reach, he pegged two strips of oak to the walls and to the tall slabs. Then he climbed on them and pegged the top of the tall slab solidly to a rafter. And then on the strips of oak, he laid a shelf above the bed. There you are, Caroline. I can't wait to see the bed made up, said Ma. Help me bring in the straw tick. And the straw tick was like a mattress. Um, Ma had filled the straw tick that morning. There was no straw on the high prairie, so she had filled it with dry, clean, dead grass. It was hot from the sunshine and had a grassy, sweet smell. Pa helped her bring it into the house and lay it on the bedstead. She tucked the sheets in and spread her prettiest, prettiest patchwork quilt over them. At the head of the bed, she set up the goose feather pillows and spread the pillow shams against them. On each white pillow sham, two little birds were outlined with red thread. So mom made the mattresses um, by taking hay and in this case, draw le uh, dead leaves and they would use straw and stick it inside of cloth to make a mattress, something softer to sleep on. And then it says their feathers were made with um, goose feathers. So, I mean, their pillows were made with goose feathers. So once the geese shed their feathers, they would collect those and then make them into pillows, which we still use some geese down today. It's called down, D-O-W-N, goose down, goose feathers. But I imagine a uh, mattress made out of just straw and dead leaves was not all that comfortable, but they didn't have the comforts of the modern world like we have. Then Pa and Ma and Laura and Mary stood and looked at the bed. It was a very nice bed. The zigzag rope was softer than the floor to sleep on. The straw tick was plump with sweet smelling grass. The quilt lay smooth and the pretty pillow sham stood up crisply. The shelf was a good place to store things. The whole house had quite an air with such a bed in it. That night when Ma went to bed, she settled into the cracking crackling straw tick and said to Pa, I declare I'm so sin comfortable here, it's almost sinful. She's finding it very luxurious and feels like kind of guilty. Mary and Laura still slept on the floor, but Pa would make a little bed for them as soon as he could. He had made the big bed and he had made a stout cupboard and a paddock locked it so that the Indians could not come and take all the cornmeal if they came again. Now he only had to dig a well and then he would make that trip to town. He must dig the well first so that Ma could have water while he was gone. Next morning, he marked a large circle in the grass near the corner of the house. 
With his spade, he cut the sod inside the circle and lifted it up in large pieces. Then he began to shovel out the earth, digging himself deeper and deeper down. Mary and Laura must not go near the well while Pa was digging. Even if they couldn't see his head anymore, shovelfuls of earth came flying up. At last, the spade flew up and fell against the grass. Then Pa jumped. His hands caught hold of the sod, and then one elbow gripped it and the other elbow. And with a heave, Pa came rolling out. I can't throw the dirt out from any deeper, he said. He had to have help now. So he took his gun and he rode away on Patty. And when he came back, he brought a plump rabbit with him, and he had which he had traded work with Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott would help him dig this well, and then he would help dig Mr. Scott's well. Ma and Laura and Mary had not seen Mr. and Mrs. Scott. Their house was hidden somewhere in a little valley on the prairie. Laura had seen smoke rising up from it, but that was all. At sunup next morning, Mr. Scott came by. He was short and stout. His hair was bleached by the sun and his skin was bright red and scaly. He did not tan, he peeled. It's this blasted sun and wind, he said. Beg your pardon, ma'am, but it's enough to make a saint use strong language. I might as well be a snake the way I keep shedding my skin in this country. Laura liked him. Every morning, as soon as the dishes were washed and the beds were made, she ran out to watch Mr. Scott and Pa working at the well. The sunshine was blistering. Even the winds were hot and the prairie grasses were turning yellow. Mary preferred to stay in the house and sew on her patchwork quilt. But Laura liked the fierce light and the sun and the wind, and she couldn't stay away from the well. But she was not allowed to go near its edge. Pa and Mr. Scott had made a stout windlass. It stood over the well, and two buckets hung from it on ends of a rope. When the windlass was turned, one bucket went down into the well, and the other bucket came up. In the morning, Mr. Scott slid down the rope and dug. He filled the buckets with earth, almost as fast as Pa could haul them up and empty them. After dinner, Pa slid down the rope into the well, and Mr. Scott hauled up the buckets. And here's a picture of... Um, that must be Mr. Scott. Every morning before Pa would let Mr. Scott go down the rope, he set a candle in a bucket and lighted it and lowered it to the bottom. Once Laura peered over the edge and she saw the candle brightly burning far down in the dark hole in the ground. Then Pa would say, seems to be all right, and he would pull up the bucket and blow out the candle. All oh, that's foolishness, Ingalls, Mr. Scott said. That well was all right yesterday. You never can tell, said Pa, better safe than sorry. Laura did not know what danger Pa was looking for by that candlelight, and she did not ask because Pa and Mr. Scott were busy. She meant to ask later, but she forgot. One morning, Mr. Scott came while Pa was eating breakfast. They heard him shout, Hi, Angles, it's sun up, let's go. Pa drank his coffee and went. The windlass began to creak and Pa began to whistle. Laura and Mary were washing the dishes and Ma was making the big bed. When Pa's whistling stopped, they heard him say, Scott, he shouted, Scott, Scott. Then he called, Caroline, come quick. Ma ran out of the house. Laura ran after her. Scott's fainted or something down there, Pa said. I've got to go after him. Did you send down the candle? Ma asked. No, I thought he had. I asked him if it was all right, and he said it was. Pa cut the empty bucket off the rope and tied the rope firmly to the windlass. Charles, you can't, you mustn't, Ma said. Caroline, I've got to. You can't, oh, Charles, no. I'll make it all right. I won't breathe till I get out. We can't let him die down there, Ma said fiercely. Laura, keep back. So Laura kept back. She stood against the house and shivered. No, no, Charles, I can't let you, Ma said. Get on Patty and go for help. There isn't time. Charles, if I can't pull you up, if you keel over down there and I can't pull you up, Caroline, I've got you, Pa said, and he swung down into the well. His head slid out of sight down the rope. Ma crouched and shaded her eyes, staring down into the well. All over the prairie, meadowlarks were rising and singing and flying straight up into the sky. The wind was blowing warmer, but Laura was cold. Suddenly, Ma jumped up and seized the handle of the windlass. She tugged at it with all her might. The rope strained and the windlass creaked. Laura thought that Pa had keeled over down there in the dark bottom of the well and Ma couldn't pull him up. 
but the windlass turned a little and a little and then a little more. Pa's hand came up holding the rope. His other hand reached above it and took hold of the rope. Then Pa's head came up. His arm held onto the windlass. Then somehow he got himself to the ground and sat there. The windlass whirled around and there was a deep thud down in the well. Pa struggled to get up and Ma said, sit still, Charles. Laura, get some water, quick. Laura ran. She came hurrying back, lugging the pail of water. Pa and Ma were both turning the windlass. The rope slowly wound itself up and the bucket came up out of the well and tied to the bucket and the rope was Mr. Scott. His arms and legs and head hung and wobbled. His mouth was partially open and his eyes were shut. Pa tugged him onto the grass. Pa rolled him over and flopped him when he rolled. Pa felt his wrists and listened to his chest and then Pa lay down beside him. He's breathing, Pa said. He'll be all right in the air. I'm all right, Caroline. I'm plumb tuckered out is all. Well, Ma scolded, I should think you would be of all the senseless performances. My goodness gracious, scaring a body to death, all for the want of a little reasonable care. My goodness, she covered her face with her apron and burst out crying. That was a terrible day. And here's a picture of them pulling Mr. Scott up with a windlass. And in the other picture that I showed you earlier, you can see the candle inside the bucket. All right. I don't want a well, Ma sobbed. It isn't worth it. I won't have you running such risks. Mr. Scott had breathed a kind of gas that stays deep in the ground. It stays at the bottom of wells because it's heavier than air. It cannot be seen or smelled, but no one can breathe it for very long and live. Pa had gone down into that gas to tie Mr. Scott to the rope so that he could be pulled up out of the gas. When Mr. Scott was able, he went home. But before he went, he said to Pa, you were right about that candle business, Ingalls. I thought it was all foolishness and I would not bother with it, but I've found now that I made a mistake. Well, said Pa, where a light can't live, I know I can't, and I like to be safe as I can be, but all's well that ends well. Pa rested a while. He had breathed a little bit of the gas and he needed to rest, but that afternoon he rabbled a thread from a tow sack and he took a little powder from his powder horn and he tied the powder in a piece of cloth with one end to the tow string and the powder. Come along, Laura, and I'll show you something. They went to the well. Pa lighted the end of the string and waited until the spark was crawling quickly along it. Then he dropped the little bundle into the well. In a minute, they heard a muffled bang and a puff of smoke came out of the well. That will bring the gas, Pa said. When the smoke was all gone, he let Laura light the candle and stand beside him while he let it down. All the way down in the dark hole, the little candle kept on burning like a star. So the next day, Pa and Mr. Scott went on digging in the well but they always sent the candle down first, every morning. There began to be a little water in the well, but not enough. The buckets came up full of mud and Pa and Mr. Scott worked every day in deeper mud. In the mornings when the candle went down, it lighted oozing wet walls and the candle it sparked in rings above the water when the bucket struck the bottom. Pa stood knee deep in water and bailed out the bucketfuls before he could begin digging the mud. One day when he was digging, a loud shout came echoing up. Ma ran out of the house and Laura ran to the well. Pull, Scott, pull, Pa yelled. A swishing, gurgling sound echoed down there. Mr. Scott turned the windlass as fast as he could and Pa came up, climbing hand over hand up the rope. I'm blamed if that's not quicksand. Pa gasped as he stepped onto the ground, muddy and dripping. I was pushing down hard on the spade when all of a sudden it went down the whole length of the handle and water came pouring up all around me. A good six feet of, of this rope is wet, Mr. Scott said after winding it up. The bucket was full of water. You showed sense in getting out of that hand over hand angles. That water came up faster than I could have pulled you out. Then Mr. Scott slapped his thigh and shouted, 
I'm blasted if you didn't bring up the spade. Sure enough, Pa had saved his spade. And a spade is like a little thing you dig with. In a little while, the well was almost full of water. A circle of blue sky lay not far down in the ground. And when Laura looked at it, a little girl's head looked back up at her. When she waved her hand, the hand on the water surface waved too. The water was clear and cold and good. Laura thought she had never tasted anything as good as those long, cold drinks of water from the well. Pa hauled no more stale, warm water from the creek. He built a solid platform then over the well and a heavy cover for the hole that let the water bucket through. Laura must never touch the cover, but whenever she or Mary were thirsty, Ma lifted the cover and drew a dripping bucket of cold, fresh water up from the well. So I'm gonna look for some more information on that, but definitely um, what they were doing with that candle was testing to make sure there was no gas down there because they were explaining there's gas sometimes down dark and it weighs more than air, so it stays. And so what Pa was doing with the little fire was making a fire to like bust up the gas so it would break up and float up and out. And then once it floated up and out, it was safe to go back down. And then the water, when you reach a certain point, the water comes bubbling up. And you guys may have seen something similar to this at the beach. If you're digging down in the sand, sometimes you can hit several layers down in the sand and water starts coming up. And the further you would dig down, the more it would be shooting up. So um, then it fills up the area and the water is cool underground and and uh, and fresh okay so we'll stop there <laughs>